Chapter 11 Felix looked out from the walls near the gargoyle gate. Today was the day, no doubt about it. The legions of chaos worshippers knew it. All the soldiers on the wall knew it. All the citizens behind them knew it too. There was something in the air that you didn't have to be a sorcerer to spot. The clouds in the sky were red, streaked through with occasional flickers of black and silver. A crimson haze covered over the surrounding land, turning the snow the color of blood and obscuring the more distant elements of the Chaos Army from sight. Something about that glow made the skin on the back of Felix's neck prickle. He did not need Max Schreiber to tell him that foul magic was at work here. Even as he watched, thousands and thousands of warriors moved up to take their position. Regiment was too disciplined a word to describe the mob there, he decided. They were more like primitive tribesmen bound together in the service of some potent chieftain. They seethed around the base of the demonic war machines, eerily silent in the ruddy light. How many tribes of the chaos scum were there? He could count at least a dozen different banners belonging to the fur-garbed humans alone. There was a flayed man. There was a face with the lips soon shut. Above one force fluttered a symbol of a free-headed howling dog. Above the heads of others floated banners depicting some kind of demon. Felix wished he could be certain that the only chaos-worshipping humans near him were those outside the wall. The events of the previous evening had left him shaken. He guessed he could never know whether Willem was a traitor or not. He had certainly been a mutant, the stigmata had already appeared on his body. But according to the Duke and Gotrek, he had fought to save his brother's life and died in the attempt. I guess he was innocent and it was all part of Jan Pavlovich's plan to sow dissension among the leadership of the city. That was if Jan Pavlovich really was the highest-ranking cultist, a fact that Felix frankly doubted. He wondered if the young noble had really thrown himself out the window when Snorri and Bjorni were drinking, or whether the slayers had actually given him a bit of help. It did not seem too politic to ask and there was no sense in falling out with the others now that the moment of battle was near. They would all have to stand together if they were to have any chance of survival. Felix shook his head, wondering what he was thinking. Such thoughts would never occur to the Slayers. That was not why they were there. They were here seeking a heroic doom. There would be plenty of those to go around this morning, Felix knew. He glanced sidelong at the others to see how they were taking things. Gotrek looked as grim as ever. His gaze never left the advancing horde. He seemed to be singling out individuals as if judging whether they would be worthy of his time in single combat. Felix smiled looking at the Slayer. There was one who was definitely going to sell his life dearly and drag dozens, at the very least, down to hell with him. Snorri clutched his head and groaned, apparently more concerned with his hangover than the prospect of death out there. Occasionally, he would break off from his moaning just long enough to shout some dwarfish obscenities in the direction of the Chaos Worshippers for interrupting his slumber. Bjorni stood nearby with one arm around Sasha and the other around Mona. Felix wondered how he had managed to drag them all the way to the wall and how he had managed to convince them to come with him in this place of danger. Money, most likely, although, judging by the way they held him close, they seemed to feel some genuine affection for him. It was a funny old world, Felix thought. Uli stood nearby, looking pale and thoughtful. His hand played with his stubby beard, and he looked up at the sky as if not wanting to look too closely at the enemy. Felix could not blame him. Not many people like to watch certain death approaching them, not even all slayers. Max and Ulrika stood close to the duke and his retinue. Max peered off into the distance as if viewing things only he could see. Ulrika didn't even look in Felix's direction. He thought he should have been hurting more than he was, but it was obvious that their affair had run its course, and even in the unlikely event of both of them surviving this, it was most likely they would part. A shame, he thought, but there it was. The Duke looked stern and commanding, and his soldiers were doing their best to put on a brave face. 
Under normal circumstances, they would have managed it too. The winged lion was fluttering from every tower, and from the pennons of a hundred companies. Heavily armed men crowded the battlements. Swords, spears, and halberds clutched in gauntleted fists. Units of archers made ready to fire as soon as the enemy advanced. Manganels, ballistae, and other war machines rose from ranks every fifty paces or so. Felix knew that in the honeycombed walls beneath them, more archers made ready to fire through the arrow slits and the murder holes. He could smell boiling oil being heated and hot pitch being made ready to pour on the stumps of the wounded. The canisters of alchemical fire were in the open now, ready to be loaded into the siege machines. He wished he hadn't eaten anything in the morning, but now it was too late. He saw more movement in the distance. A vast cloud of harpies rose from the mass of chaos worshippers and seethed and wheeled above it like a flock of swallows circling a temple spire on a summer evening. Not the most apt analogy, Felix thought. More like flocks of demons rising from some fiery hell to seek their prey among the lost souls beneath them. He hoped that the archers and the wizards were ready. He did not relish the prospect of fighting off a horde of those foul-smelling, bat-winged monsters. Vivid memories of his narrow escape from them in the chaos waste came back too easily to his mind. The harpies began to slowly circle around the city, spiraling higher and higher, until they were simply small dots in the vast blood-red sky. Obviously, they were not planning on attacking just yet. Motion on the ground attracted Felix's attention once more. Hordes of beastmen were making their way through the humans and forming up slightly ahead of them, leaving gaps through which other units might pass. It was like watching a huge chessboard on which the pieces were made of flesh and blood and were constantly in motion. Now it was the black-clad chaos warriors advancing to the beating of huge drums. Ranks of cavalry rode over the ramps across the forward trenches of the chaos line. Massive war altars were carried on the shoulders of tattooed fanatics. Suddenly, there was a deadly silence. Felix raised his spyglass to his eye and focused on the great silk pavilion in the center of the army. From that came out Arik Demonclaw, his warlords and his wizards. Felix could see the two evil-looking albino twins, gold-robed and black-robed, and a horde of lesser mages, all clad in thick raiments covered in the oddly glowing symbols, and all of them bearing staffs that looked as if they had been carved from bone, and topped by human skulls. Judging by appearances, Felix guessed that there was some kind of argument taking place between the Chaos General and the Wizards. He was gesturing angrily and pointing at the city walls, while the mages at first shook their heads and finally nodded. What was going on there? Felix wondered. Arik Demonclaw was livid. All night he had listened to the bickering of his warlords as each one sought a prime position for himself and his followers in the coming assault, and attempted to persuade Arik to place them ahead of their rivals. All night he had listened to the foolish carpings of his wizards, telling him that the time was not right for their spells, that the stars were not correctly aligned, that the ultimate force had not been summoned yet. He was sure this was all an excuse. His spies, and there were many of those, had brought him word that Loigor and Kalmain had been visiting many of his warlords. When challenged, they had claimed they were simply doing their best to hold the army together and reassure his followers that all was going well. Arek was having none of it. He knew they were plotting against him, and that it would be only a matter of time before one or more of his minions rose against him. This constant inactivity... This protesting about stars and omens was simply buying his enemies time during which the army was becoming bored and restless with inaction, and ripe for rebellion against him. Worse than that, his enemies were gaining time to gather against him. Scouts reported that the Ice Queen's army was but a few days away, and there was a force of Skaven advancing from the north. True, these forces were relatively small, but Arik knew that many mighty armies had been routed due to being attacked at the right time. This was not going to happen to this army. 
all thoughts of rebellion and inaction were going to end today. He was not going to give them time for that. Soon, all of his army was going to be too busy to be bothered plotting against him. Soon, he would give them a victory that would unite the entire horde behind him once again, and give those that would challenge him a lot of pause. Today, they would sweep over the walls of Prague and claim total and final victory. Max Schreiber watched the mages of the Chaos Horde advance to the fore. His interest about this was more than professional. Very soon, his life, and the woman he cared about, might depend on his understanding of what he saw there. He watched the albino twins the closest of all. There was something about that pair that set them apart. To Max's trained senses, they almost glowed with power. They were the mightiest mages he had ever seen, far stronger than even his old masters, or Max himself. The others with them were certainly their acolytes. They watched the twins with wary respect, and seemed to be hanging at their every word and gesture. The two mages advanced to the clear ground in front of the horde, still well out of bowshot of the walls. They stood silent, heads down for a moment, then glanced at each other, raised their arms, and began to chant. In the beginning, nothing happened. Max detected only the slightest stirring of the winds of magic, and then only because his senses were keyed to the highest pitch. One by one, the mages around the albinos bowed their heads and began to chant too. And as they did so, Max began to feel a subtle change in the air. The winds of magic swirled stronger now, as did the real breeze. Cool fingers of air touched Max's face. Tendrils of power flickered out from the staffs of the twins and touched the mighty war engines around them. Arcs of power jumped from engine to engine, forming a latticework almost too intricate for Max's eyes to follow. As he watched, beam after beam reached upwards and outwards, touching the glowing clouds overhead. Thunder rumbled. Lightning flickered downwards. It was not normal lighting, Max could tell. It was pregnant with all the power the Chaos Horde had drawn from the northern waste. The huge bolts all lashed downwards and struck the tips of one of the twin staffs. As they did so, the mages seemed to swell with ominous power. To Max's trained eye, their auras became even brighter. Their voices swelled until their chanting could be heard from the walls of Prague. The words were full of evil import and repeated the name of Tsinch constantly. As Max was watching, the snow around the sorcerers melted away from around them until an area about 50 strides across was clear, and the brown earth was visible underneath. As the thunder rumbled, the clouds began to swirl, like water in a whirlpool. In their midst, a gap opened revealing the sky above. Through that gap, the evil chaos moon, more sleep, was glaring down. It glowed bright like a sun, and more than once, the aura surrounding it seemed to form a wicked leering face with a gaping mouth, and a massive tongue that gazed down hungrily on the city. Max heard the people closer to him whimper and moan. He knew why. That wicked face was depicted on the tapestries in the palace, and in the sculptures of the many buildings. It was the same malevolent visage which had glared down on Prague two centuries ago. The air vibrated with energy. A monstrous rumbling began, as the light of the moon fell on the huge siege engines. Auras flickered around them. Their metal forms shuddered and vibrated and began to move. It was a terrifying and awe-inspiring sight, like watching a field of massive metal statues come to life. The sorcerers did not cease in their chanting either. The haze surrounding the army seemed to clot and congeal, drawing itself together into massive blocks of reddish light. Then these seemed to shrink and dwindle, and at the same time concentrate. As they did so, the outlines of humanoid figures began to appear. At first they were only vague, monstrous shapes, but as the long minutes went on, and the chanting of the wizards continued, they became solid, featureless figures of light and then took on shape and definition until thousands of them were present. Max recognized many of them from the forbidden tomes he had studied. 
Those things, which somehow suggested evil animated fungi, were the flamers of change, lesser demons of considerable power. Pink beings with massive heads, where their torsos should have been, capered and danced on the open ground. And now, the other mages of the army began to join in. Max guessed that these were the priests and sorcerers in the service of the other powers, taking advantage of all the dark magic Arex house wizards had summoned. As Max watched, more and more demonic figures emerged from nothingness into being. He recognized the demonettes of Slanesh, odd androgynous figures with one bare breast, hairless heads, and one mighty claw like a crab spincer. They had a strange and disturbing beauty. Some of them rode on odd bipedal creatures with long flickering tongues. Others marched afoot and brandished long blades. Amid the ranks of black-armored chaos warriors, other figures were materializing. Mighty hounds with teeth of steel and great colors of flesh coming out of their necks. Huge armored warriors bounded onto the backs of mighty red and bronze steeds far more massive than any horse. Strange, slithering, slug-like creatures bubbled into being ahead of the disease ranks of the followers of Nurgle. All of them were surrounded by a halo of power which told Max of their demonic origin. In all of his life, he had never witnessed such a potent summoning, or seen so much mystical power unleashed in one place. He doubted he would ever live long enough to see it again. Felix watched the Chaos Horde begin its advance. It was all he could do to keep himself from whimpering with fear, like some of those around him. He wondered whether he would survive an hour. Massive metal siege towers, carved with the effigies of hideous demons, began to rumble forward. The teams of sweating, near-naked men drew some of them. Others moved under their own sorcerous power, rumbling ever closer to the wall. Huge trebuchet arms swung backwards and forwards, sending loads of massive stones tumbling towards the walls. Felix heard screams and shrieks from a distant section of the line as their cargo of death descended among the defenders. Now, tens of thousands of marauders, beastmen and chaos warriors began to charge forward, racing through the snow towards the walls. Their shouts and screams were terrible to hear. Mighty drums were beaten. Huge horns were sounding. The wind brought the odors of brimstone and corrupt bodies to Felix's nostrils. He gripped his sword tight and fought to steady himself. It was difficult. He recognized some of the things racing towards them from the time spent in the tunnels underneath Karak Doom. Those hounds, for example, were demonic things, whose flesh no normal weapon could pierce. He wondered how the defenders were supposed to stop those. Gotrek's axe was capable of killing them, but the Slayer was only one, and he could not be everywhere at once. Please ask them to keep the noise down. Snorri has a bit of a hangover, said Snorri. Felix almost smiled. Some of the tension eased out of him too. He decided that whatever approached, and however powerful it was, he was going to give as good an account of himself as he could. If there was nothing else he could do, he was at least going to take some of these chaos-worshipping bastards with him. Overhead, the harpies ceased to circle and began to spiral downwards. Their long descent was nothing like the swooping dives Felix had seen them perform in the chaos wastes. He could only guess that they had been instructed to time their attack just as the siege towers were hitting the wall. They would provide an additional distraction for the defenders that they could not afford to ignore. Someone out there had obviously been planning this for a long time. The Chaos Horde moved ever closer. Most of the warriors and the demons clustered around the mighty war engines, seeking shelter in their shadow. A few of the bolder, more foolhardy, or more desperate for glory rushed onwards. The defenders on the wall watched tensely. Soon, Felix knew, the Chaos Worshippers would be in range. Now it was the time to whittle away the attackers. Felix raised the spyglass and ran it over the oncoming horde. Faces leapt into focus. Brutal barbarians. Mouths open in screams of fury, froth spilling from their lips, veins standing out on their foreheads, muscles distended, filled his vision. 
Beside them were the massive beastmen, ram-headed, horned, furred, eyes filled with red malice, in human muzzles raised to bay their bestial cries. Black helms, rune-inscribed, hid the faces of the Chaos Knights, all save their strangely glowing eyes. Demonic visages shimmered in the wicked glow of the witch moon. Felix wrenched his sight away from them and studied one of the siege towers. It was taller even than the walls of Prague, a structure built from wood and sheathed in the black iron of the wastes, doubtless drawn from the demonic forges beneath the ruins of Karag Doom. The plates were molded into the shape of a leering demon head, or inscribed with unspeakable runes whose evil light hurt the eye to look. The tower that Felix gazed upon now had a massive cast head of corn attached to the front. Its wheels were embossed with faces similar to that of the great bloodthirster he had faced in the lost dwarf city. It gave the impression of immense size and solidity. It seemed more like a mobile tower from some iron keep than an actual siege engine. And yet it moved, powered by magic, lumbering forward as fast as a man might trot bouncing on the rutted ground, crushing any beastman unfortunate enough to fall in its path. A huge, two-headed battering ram flickered from Korn's gaping maw, for all the world like the tongue of some vast snake. At the tower's top, a crew of tribesmen manned a small ballista, and were frantically bringing it to bear on the defenders. Through dozens of small windows in the machine's sides, Felix could see the shapes of warriors waiting within. He heard the chant of prayer and spell close on him now. Fireballs erupted from the walls of Prague, arching outwards and downwards into the oncoming horde. Bolts of lightning flickered out of the turbulent sky. Odd golden glows appeared over the heads of the bellowing chaos warriors. Most of the spells spluttered and died, absorbed by the eerie haze surrounding the evil army, or neutralized by the work of the horde's own sorcerers. One or two did hit home, though. As Felix watched, a fireball exploded among a regiment of beastmen. A score of them were blown to pieces where they stood. A dozen more caught fire and raced randomly along their brothers, blazing like human torches till they were cut down or trampled underfoot. At that sight, a cheer went up from the warriors on the wall. It was a first but small victory. Felix hoped there would be many, many more. A creaking followed by a loud twang announced to Felix that one of the mighty catapults near him had been brought to bear. A mass of huge rocks arched out over the besiegers and then, with what seemed like appalling slowness to the distant onlooker, crashed down, killing anything beneath them. It heartened Felix to see that the catapult didn't just kill its immediate target. Many of the marauders who sought to avoid a stonefall were trampled under the hooves of their beastmen comrades. That section of the approaching line was thrown into disarray by the milling of the mob. Those coming on behind them trampled more, as the press of bodies caused a huge pile-up of man and beast. More and more catapults and ballistae opened fire from the walls. More and more beastmen and marauders fell to their projectiles. More and more crushed and maimed bodies blocked the advance of at least a part of the Chaos Army, causing eddies, currents in the vast sea of flesh to rival anything in a real ocean. Kegs of alchemical fire descended on the horde, turning men and beasts alike into blazing torches, which not even the chill of the snow could extinguish. The defenders were not having it all their way, though. The huge trebuchets on the back of the enemy lines lobbed their own cargoes of death at the walls of Prague. Felix ducked as a mighty boulder passed overhead, and flinched at the sound of it crashing through red-tiled roofs behind him. The shouts of alarm and the smell of burning told him that either it had upset some fire or stove within the broken building, or the stone had borne some sinister enchantment which caused the blaze where it fell. Felix frantically hoped that it was the former, but suspected it would be all too easy to prove to be the latter. Among the horde, some of the mages, either forgetting what they knew of the defenses of Prague, or too filled by their own sense of superiority to care, sent spells hurtling across the walls. As Felix watched, a fiery bowl, in which was visible a leering evil face, came towards the defenders. 
The ancient enchantments held good, and the spell fizzled out paces from the battlements, sending the sour stench of brimstone into the nostrils of the warriors manning them. Shouts of triumph and relief from along the line told him that the old enchantments still held there as well. Thousands of bows twanged, thousands of arrows driven by all the power of short Kislevite composite bows and dwarf-made crossbows rained down on the attackers. Screams of agony mingled with shouts of bloodlust. Another volley and hundreds more died. Officers shouted commands, archers reloaded and fired. Crossbowmen worked the mechanisms of their weapons. Corpses were littering the snow now, but they were crushed to jelly beneath the wheels of the advancing siege machines. The lords of death stalked the battlefield, feasting hungrily on the souls of the slain. A hideous stench, a crack of wings opening to slow a fast descend, and the rough cawing of raucous voices all warned Felix that the harpies had entered the fray. He ducked the sweep of an iron taloned claw and hacked right through the wrist of an attacker. Spurting black blood, the winged humanoid tumbled backwards away from the wall and fluttered downwards to be impaled in the spike-filled pits below. Felix wiped the ichor from his face and spat, and then glanced along the wall. Hundreds of the batwing humanoids wrestled and clawed at the defenders, distracting the archers and interfering with the work of the siege engines at this critical point of the battle. More and more of them surged overhead and descended onto the city to spread fire and alarm. Felix watched with some satisfaction as archers from the streets below picked off more than a few of them, but more and more descended from the blood-red heavens to continue their wicked work. Godric's war cry got Felix's attention. A swipe of the Slayer's axe slew two of the vile creatures in one blow, its star metal blade seeming to sear their flesh as it passed through it. Snorri pinned one of them with his foot while he bashed out the brains of another with his hammer, all the while keeping the beast's companions at bay with his axe. Bjorni, somehow, had hidden the two girls somewhere, and was now dealing terrible damage to the attackers with a military pick. Uli wrestled with another of the harpies near Felix. The man raced over and with a lunge passed the blade through the harpy's back. Uli rose to his feet, glaring and spitting blood. I could have taken it, he shouted. Felix gestured around them. Plenty more where that came from. Uli nodded and plunged once more into the fray. A familiar searing golden light blazed along the battlements. Felix recognized Max's magic at work. Powerful magic, too. Half a dozen winged monsters shriveled and fell under the impact. Felix looked around to see Max and Ulrika standing side by side, the area around them clear of all monsters. He gave a thumbs-up sign and was answered with nods. Suddenly, the harpies seemed to have had enough. They rose from the battlements, shrieking defiance, and surged on into the city instead. At least on this section of the line, they had found the defenders too tough for them. Felix looked out at the advancing horde. They had made good use of the distraction to get even closer to the city walls. Only a few hundred paces separated them from the stonework now, 